Good. Hey everyone. So last time we were talking about wastewater microbiology and the secondary treatment steps, how we use the biology to drive our treatment. Uh, and we took a look at this example where we had a pond and we were acting as if that pond is an aerated basin that we can grow microbes in to consume some waste substance and we're checking to see how effective that was and uh, kind of learning how to do some of the mass balances with all of those equations with the complexity of both having both X which is the microbes and S the substrate the food um, in play so we worked through problem a uh, just about to the end so I wanted to pick up there finish problem a go through B and C and then we'll talk about what this looks like if we have a recycle line instead of just <clears throat> instead of just a simple CSTR uh, with an in and an out if we modify that to have recycle of the bacteria <clears throat> the sludge then we can uh, this mass balance ends up changing so we will take a look at that and some equations um, some related equations I did uh, just before class I posted the new uh, equation sheet for your that you'll have for your final exam so that's um, that's online now I expect I'll put out a homework your last homework sometime next week um, I also hope to return your I, I will return your homework three and exam twos to you at some point next week um, because believe it or not that's our last week uh, in in person so time has been flying um, again I'm I'm still on schedule to go ahead and give you off the uh, Tuesday before Thanksgiving uh, in light of the fact that we didn't have a fall break so that's that's still my plan and I believe we can get through enough content uh, to allow that okay so the the homework by the way will cover and the exam as well the final exam uh, we'll cover what we're learning now and some of the nutrient removal and BOD measurement and removal that we'll learn uh, learn about next week and um, we might have one lecture after the holiday um, and then a kind of an exam review and then we'll following that is the exam week so that's kind of the plan at the moment So with that, we'll go ahead and get back to this problem here. Uh, so part A, we were looking at the amount of BOD. This is the amount of waste stuff, S, leave it, leaving the pond. So we derived this equation for S. And so at this point, it's just a matter of plugging in the, the values. And we have uh, some of these values given. So if we put them all together and use that equation, we should end up finding that S equals 6.9 milligrams BOD per liter. So that would that would end up being our solution to part A. And again, this equation here is specific to a CSDR with no recycle. Okay, so part B then. This one asks, what is the BOD or the biodegradable organic matter removal efficiency of the pond? Um, we're going to say that biodegradable organic matter is S. That's our BOD. So we're going to say, um, so S removal efficiency. And we can define that rather rather simply as the amount we started with minus the amount we ended with divided by the amount we started with. And that should give us, and we can multiply that by 100% to get it into percentage instead of a fraction. And when we do that, that's, uh, let's see, we started with What did we start with? 95 
So it's 95 minus 6.9 divided by 95 times 100%, and that should be about 93%. So it actually removes a fair bit of the uh, the S, the, the waste in this case. Uh, so even just a pond growing enough bacteria, given enough, given a large enough residence time, it can do a pretty good job removing that BOD. Now that uh, should be in a way obvious because that's what we're concerned about happening if we discharge too much BOD to nature, right? The, the natural bacteria and stuff are going to deplete the oxygen based on consuming all of that. So there is a question about, okay, how much, how much is being removed versus how much is being replenished by the mixing with the atmosphere and the, there's some stuff about the transport of oxygen into the water from the atmosphere. We'll get into a little bit of that uh, in our next and last section on BOD. Um, but for now, we can just kind of take a look at the big picture and say, okay, that's um, that that kind of makes sense and we can see how that would happen and in this case we don't know whether or not it's a problem for the pond but it this is the type of issue that can become pro a big problem for lakes and ponds okay so that's that's it for part B that was uh, pretty simple there part C then is asking us the concentration of volatile suspended solids leaving the pond so that's asking about X so we know that X is growing, so this amount of bacteria, microbes are growing in there, and so that's that's our question here, and so we need a mass balance, but this time, instead of doing a mass balance on X, again, it's counterintuitive, we just did that for part A, because we could ultimately get that in, in terms of S, and all the X is dropped out. This time, we need a mass balance on S because the way the substrate changes now that we know what concentration it is uh, it does depend on X and we can um, ultimately solve for X when we do it this way all right so if you wanted to try this on your own I would encourage you to do so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and walk you through it so um, so that we can get on with the uh, other problems. And I've got another example problem at the end. Um, you'll have another case where you can basically do the same problem um, on your own if you'd like. OK, so we need this mass balance. And so we start off by saying, all right, the accumulation, and we're going to assume steady state and all that. So we're going to say 0 equals what's coming in for s, so q s naught. minus what's going out, so QS, plus whatever is reacting away. So we have, um, we'll say in the volume, we've got some rate of substrate utilization. And we talked about this uh, um, last class, this rate of substrate utilization, we know RSU, we define that as essentially proportional to the rate of growth in there, except a negative, negative of that, divided by the yield coefficient. So this is this is how we're relating the substrate change to the change in x. So the rate at which x is growing, the microbes are growing, this gives us that connection. So we can say we know r of g, that was the mu x, so we can say the rate of substrate utilization is going to be um, we'll go ahead and take out the one over the negative one over y and multiply by r of g and we know r of g is mu max times s and I'm going to go ahead and put the x here divided by ks plus s Now this is this is coming from when we said r of g is equal to x times mu, and all this stuff in here is the mu, and the x is added on there. 
So just kind of a reminder there, that's, that's where we're coming from. This is RG. So now we have a way to get this rate of substrate utilization in terms of X. It's also in terms of S, but we already solved for that, so we're going to be okay. So now we can put this term right into here, and that'll be, um, that'll be our, our next step in this mass balance. So we can say 0 is QS0 minus QS. And here I'll just go ahead and say minus Vx times, so I took the x out of here, and I'm going to go, go ahead and say this times mu max s divided by ks plus s with the y down here as well. So that's just inserting it, simplifying just a tad. And then we can divide everything by q. Uh, that will help simplify. We can also divide, um, you know, we'll divide everything by s in a moment too, I think. Uh, but let's go ahead and divide by q. So we have 0 equals s naught minus s minus v over q is theta x times all of this stuff, mu max s over ks plus s times y. And here we just need to solve for x. Um, so as we, as we simplify, it's just a matter of subtracting s naught, adding s, um, getting rid of the, dividing both sides by negative 1, dividing both sides by theta, and dividing both sides by this value. So when we do that, the simplification becomes, and again, this is useful, and I th think I may have given it to you on the equation sheet, but this is, again, for a specific case where we have a CSDR with no recycle. There's, and we've already solved, or we have access to the amount of S in the system. So here we have, find my cursor again. So here we have ks plus s. Oops. Supposed to be the subscript, subscript there. So ks plus s times s naught minus s divided by theta ks. So this would be the equation we can use. We've solved mass balance on substrate concentration, and we solved that for x. So really, it's, it's mostly about algebra once you're setting up the problem. Um, so this k at the bottom, that's coming from, let's see, where did I? Um, that's coming from the definition of y. So we, we saw previously, and I'm, I apologize I didn't write this up for you here. Um, so we know that the y is related to k and mu max. write this up again. So we have little k is equal to mu max over y. I do apologize. I uh, forgot to add in this step here for you. So when we have this relationship and we notice right here we have mu max and y, we can simplify that to the k. Um, so that's, that's where that's coming from. And then we can just take it as k right there. Uh, you could also leave it with mu max and y. Um, and then you might find that, OK, well, we didn't have y, so, but we did have k and mu max. So then you need to remember this. Or you do have this formula in the um, formula sheet. OK, 
so that's that's going into that part. Okay, so then once you put in these numbers, uh, given the values, again, uh, we're using the default values from the book, and here our x is going to be equal to 43 milligrams of VSS per liter. That's the amount in the pond, which means that's the amount leaving the pond because it's we're assuming it's perfectly mixed. All right, any questions on this? So are we always assuming it's perfectly mixed? For a CSTR, yes. Um, and for batch reactors, yes. We, we defined those reactor types in that manner. If they weren't perfectly mixed, we'd have to model them in some other way, maybe a combination of reactors or something like that. Um, but for our purposes, we, we essentially work with ideal reactors. So, last time we, we looked at this diagram here for the wastewater treatment to talk about what, what's going on, and I mentioned the importance of the recycle line, but we didn't get into the math that's required if we have this recycle. So today that's what we're going to get into, and just as a reminder, what's happening here is we have bacteria growing in this um, this basin and we are allowing them to grow basically as as fast as they can so we're removing our substrate as fast as we can then we collect all those bacteria back in the clarifier and for our class we're pretty much going to assume this is a perfect clarifier so we don't lose any bacteria leaving so that means this xe here in the effluent should be zero now we might look at a case where you know, maybe that stops happening. What's, you know, how much do we lose or what's that going to do to our recycle line, something like that. Um, but in a properly functioning uh, system that we're going to show some equations for, this Xe becomes zero. So we've got water in here and the bacteria are separating for us. That means that we've got some water and bacteria kind of a sludge flowing down this pipe. And so this pipe then is taking the sludge and it's going to discharge some of it as waste. And this uh, waste is sometimes processed into what we call biosolids. Uh, we might talk about that kind of as a, a last uh, point of interest for the class if we have time. Um, but essentially, we, if we process it correctly, we can use that as kind of a fertilizer. We just have to make sure it is treated um, with some heat and other processes. And then it, it may be safe to apply to an extent. Okay, whatever we don't send to the waste, this WAS line or waste activated sludge line, um, would be recycled in our RAS line, R-A-S. And you'll, if you ever go to a wastewater treatment plant and talk to them about this, they'll They'll use these terms pretty commonly. Oh yeah, our WAS line, blah, 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 or, um, and here's our RAS line. It's talking about the return or recycled activated sludge. So this is our step here that recycles it. Of course, you might add in some other anaerobic chambers or something to process um, your sludge that may be over here, but in general, what we're doing is taking some of these microbes and recycling them to allow us to have a higher input concentration of X naught. So if we say X naught is right here as it enters, um, well, let, let me say X naught prime because we already labeled this here. Okay, so if our X naught is something like zero, but we want our 
bacteria here to have plenty, we want to have plenty of bacteria in here so that they are growing, um, we're, we're really growing a lot of them, which is true, we want that. Then we have to add more bacteria here. Uh, so this XR is going to contribute to make our X prime higher than it would have been. Okay, so that's going to allow us to have a, a starting point for the growth of bacteria to be much higher. In our pond example, we had X naught as zero, and that meant for our mass balance for X, it was essentially Q X naught. This went away because it was zero. And we don't want that. We want a significant, in this case, X prime zero, I'll call it, so that the amount that's growing um, is instantly larger. If you start off with just a few microbes and give them food, it's going to take a while before they're set up and ready to eat and at high enough concentration to really make a difference. So we're um, circumventing that problem by doing this recycle line. So with this recycle, um, one thing we want to note here is as we pipe this down uh, from the clarifier, we have some flow rate here. So we have Q, um, this would be QW plus QR. So I'll say QW plus R here. So that's whatever flow rate we have here is the combination of the recycle and uh, waste line. And that's going to have some concentration of bacteria as well. And this concentration is going to be the same because when we split it in two ways we're doing nothing to the concentration right we're just diverting it we haven't done a membrane separation or anything like that so we're not changing the concentration here um, the clarifier changes the concentration because we've changed the amount of, of mass here per uh, volume of water moving because we've removed a lot of the water so QE here is large much larger than Q W plus R. So most of our water is going out uh, out the effluent because that's you know that's the purpose of the wastewater treatment is to discharge treated wastewater. So that's um, by definition here we don't want a very large amount of water going back um, or going out this solids waste line, sludge waste line. Okay so my point here is this XR and this X, what we might say XW, are really the same things. Because this, this process right here is not changing anything. That's just a pipe uh, diverting to two pieces. Ultimately, what happens here is this flow rate right here, the WAS flow rate, QW, that actually controls a lot of this process and we'll see it play out but essentially it's controlling how much bacteria are we uh, sending out and away into the landfill compared to how much we're recycling because if we reduce this then we're recycling more if we increase this then we're recycling less that's going to control how much x is in the actual tank which means that's going to control how much substrate we're consuming. So operators can conveniently control this one parameter to control several aspects about what's happening inside the aeration basin. So this becomes important. We're going to see that in a, a few equations here in a minute. Okay, so a few assumptions, and I've already touched on some of this. When we're dealing with these clarifiers, we first of all assume this X E is zero. That's right here. That's the perfect clarifier assumption. Another thing we go ahead and assume is that, you know, whatever's happening in this clarifier, there's not enough time or aeration or mixing or any of that to really have a significant amount of biological activity. So while we have water in here, and there's a bunch of bacteria accumulating at the bottom, we're just not treating this as part of our treatment train 
uh, in terms of looking at the reactions. So this no biological um, activity in the clarifier, what it's doing for us is it's kind of simplifying our reaction volume. or uh, control volume, really. So the only, only volume that we need to be concerned about for the actual reaction of the biological stuff is in here. We do, even though stuff is happening in the pipes, for sure, and some little bit, you know, something happens in the clarifier, we're not giving it the conditions for this optimal growth and, and everything like that. And it just really doesn't stay in there long enough for it to make a huge difference. So that helps us, that assumption helps us keep, keep our mind just on this uh, aeration tank and uh, we can go from there. Another assumption here is when we look at the amount of, uh, F, um, amount of substrate, this S, the waste that we're trying to get rid of, the BOD, if we look at the S in the effluent, so SE, we could call it, that's going to be the same S as in the waste. It's going to be the same S as in the recycle, if you wanted to call it that. And that's going to be the same S that's in the tank. And this should become obvious when you say, when you see that what's happening to the dissolved stuff nothing happens to the dissolved stuff. The clarifier does not change the, um, the dissolved fraction. It's changing the solid particles, right? It's changing where the solids are going by letting them settle out. So when we have the S flowing through, this S is not changed by splitting two flows. Just like nothing changes in this pipe here for solids or liquids, or dissolved, I mean, Nothing happens in the clarifier for the dissolved fraction because it's just uh, st still suspended, dissolved in the water, and it's just going in either direction. Okay, so that's uh, going to be important to recognize as you, you know, if we were to talk about the amount of substrate, um, we, we may have this S prime initial after we mix the, these two streams because we have some S in this line, essentially we're going to be diluting this just a little bit. So there's a, a few things to consider there as we work with this system. Okay, so that's uh, just pointing out that we're not changing, um, we're not changing the amount of dissolved stuff as we're going through. All right, the last thing, and I did already mention this, the XR here and the XW here are the same. And that is true because um, this, this change in the pipe here doesn't change, um, change anything about the dynamics there. We also assume that XE is zero, talked about that. And this also tells us that since XE is zero, we do know that XW, the amount we're wasting, is going to be larger than the amount that's in the tank itself. So we've concentrated it. Um, if XE was not zero, then we don't know how much we've concentrated it. Um, maybe all of the X is escaping and we didn't concentrate it at all. And then, um, you know, XE or XW would equal X. Um, if the clarifier doesn't work at all. But since it works, then we know, um, we know this fact. So as you're working on your problems, you can check this should be true. Um, it would be a convenient way to double check on your work. Okay, so the important parameters here then, um, and we're not gonna solve a direct mass balance like we, like we typically would, Instead, we have some equations that help us deal with and understand the system uh, in a sense on a simpler basis, even though it's a little bit more complicated of a system. So the first uh, equation or concept we need then 
is what we call the food to mass ratio. I kind of touched on this last time where, I, where we were talking about you know, how much food is required to make the bacteria happy and at what growth, at what rate are they going to grow based on their specific, um, you know, their maximum specific growth rate versus their specific growth rate given some amount of food. Well, this food to mass ratio then is talking about the amount of food bacteria have compared to the amount of bacteria we have. Um, and again, that, that's a simple concept of you have more bacteria they need or can consume more food. And this is really quantifying it um, in terms of food to mass over time. So it's uh, the way we define it is the flow rate times the substrate coming in, S0, divided by the volume times the concentration of X. So what this gives us, if we take a look at the units, Q then will take in days, really we could use um, some other unit we just might need to convert, but we have a flow rate and that's going to cancel with the, so that's going to be volume per time, so the per time ends up down here. The volume term will cancel with the volume term within S0. So S0 is going to be milligrams per liter of BOD. Um, so then the flow, if we put it in liters, will cancel that. So we'll get milligrams BOD per, and down here the same thing happens. We have volume times a concentration, which the volumes will cancel. So then we have mil this milligrams BOD per milligrams VSS per day or per time. Okay, so these are, this then is a, the mass of food per mass of microbes over time. That gives us an estimate of uh, that, that amount of food that the bacteria have available. And like I said, their growth rate coefficient depends on that amount of food. So in order to control how fast they're growing and how much uh, waste they're going to consume and process, we need to control this food to mass ratio. It can also allow or disallow certain species of bacteria to grow. So this is not just in terms of grow, you know, providing enough uh, waste degradation, but it also has to do with keeping the right bacteria growing. Some bacteria do better than others when they have plenty of food versus some may do better when they're, uh, they have a scarce resource um, set up. Maybe they can compete and fight with other bacteria, produce toxins to signal or kill each other. Um, and so controlling the food to mass ratio uh, is important just to keep the, the type of bacteria growing happily as well. And so there are some ranges that are typically used in practice. Um, and that might be, you know, maybe some specific wastewater process will keep it in uh, a given range. And that might be a little different from some other um, some other treatment plant, just given their, their differences and what kind of um, waste they get routinely. Okay, you also kind of want a consistent food type. You don't want to vary greatly from mostly municipal then to suddenly lots of restaurant waste or something like that. Um, now you can't really control too well what happens, but it's something something in consideration for the operators. Um, if you have a heavy tourist area, you might, you might recognize that your, your food to mass ratio and possibly the consistency, the composition of the waste may change drastically um, based on what, what season it is. And ultimately kind of the, the big goal here controlling these types of parameters is to avoid sludge flotation. Sludge flotation is when the wrong type of bacteria start to grow and instead of sinking, all your bacteria start floating and then your bacteria all escape out in the waste and your clarifier doesn't work. And that not only makes a lot of bacteria go out your effluent, but it also means you're no longer recycling and so you have lower, fewer bacteria in your system which means you're treating less waste. 
And so then you're going to have a compounding effect where you're discharging a lot more waste, um, the S, and you're having the bacteria go. It's just a bad, a bad time for everybody, and it turns out that that also begins to stink really bad, um, typically. So we just want to avoid sludge flotation, and that avoids lots of problems. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the video I showed last time where we, ha we saw some layer of sludge foam stuff on the top, um, I believe that one was operating pretty normally. You're going to have some flo floating materials, um, and usually we call it the scum layer. And that's typical because we just had a process with all this aeration. And some particles are going to have, you know, caught onto bubbles and just are, they're going to be floating. There's going to be some amount of that, um, but the majority of the bacteria will usually settle unless the wrong type starts growing and they grow these filamentous materials and then they, they all kind of float up as a blanket and you're getting clarification, but it's in the wrong direction. And so it's, a, uh, you know, may, maybe if I have a little extra time here, I'll search for a video, see if we can find that. Um, I actually, I haven't seen seen a video of it myself, but it would be a interesting one to see what it looks like when you've got that uh, flotation problem. But good question. Okay, so on that note, the hydraulic retention time of the solids versus the excuse me, the hydraulic retention time of the water versus the solids retention time of the solids. Uh, becomes really important here. Now, earlier we made the assumption that the biological activity is not happening in the clarifier uh, or in the pipes, so that helps us with the hydraulic part. That means the for the relevant control volume of the reaction, we're really just looking at the tank itself. Um, so we, the, according to the book, we have this activated sludge control volume drawn this outer boundary, but if we're just looking at the reaction that's happening inside this tank, we really can use just this here for the hydraulic retention time because we said that, that we have no reaction happening elsewhere. So V over Q is still in effect for our theta, um, and that's this volume here, and the flow rate, we'll notice here, the Q out here. So we have a small Q coming in and going out, but that's, you know, that's repeated. So really the hydraulic residence time is just going to be um, this amount because essentially we are adding and subtracting a little bit um, from that Q recycle. It's a, a very small flow anyway. It really wouldn't make a significant difference in the calculations. So our volume, um, again, yeah, so for hydraulic re residence time, that's what I just mentioned. Um, we assumed the no the biological activity. And, uh, okay, so I misspoke a little. If you, if you do look at the control volume on the outside, the Q doesn't change, right? There's the same Q here as out here. I, so I explained it kind of poorly. If you add QE plus Q waste, this is equal to Q. And so in terms of the hydraulic resonance time in that entire system, it's still uh, V over Q. The reaction is only happening in the aeration tank, but the, flow, the net flow of water um, We can use that bigger control volume and see see why that works. And I apologize for saying that backwards at, at first. Okay, so all that to say, we use the the total flow and our volume of the aeration tank. So that's relatively simple. Um, just note that the hydraulic residence time does not change. The solids, however, does change, and I, I believe this is a an image of recycling sludge back into a 
uh, into an activated sludge chamber. So the solids or cell, sometimes people call it cell retention time, and our book has theta C. Um, I'm using that because that's what they used. So theta C, the cell retention time, also known as SRT, and just give me a moment, I'm going to close the door. Okay, so this SRT, the solids retention time, it does change when we add this recycle line, and that's, uh, that's something we need to account for. So as we're considering, you know, how do we account for the solids coming through, we want to know um, essentially how long do the solids stay in the system. The reason we care about that is because x matters, right? So x is the amount of solids, the concentration of solids, and we use x in several different calculations uh, to understand how our, how our system changes. Um, so we need to know how long it's staying in the system. Okay, we can define, just like we do with uh, water, we can define our solids retention time based on how much solids is there. Vx, this is going to be the mass, right? So Vx is, let's say, liters times milligrams per liter. Um, so that's gonna, the liters will cancel and that'll give us just milligrams, for example. So that's gonna be the mass, um, mass of solids. to keep this clean and we're going to divide it by um, essentially the amount of time it stays there um, so on the bottom or excuse me we're going to divide it by or ultimately our our retention time is going to be a time so we need to divide it by mass divided by time that's where we have this qe so q would be um, volume yeah, we'll, we'll just say liters. So that'll be liters per day, let's say, times mass, or we'll, we'll leave it milligrams for the moment, milligrams per liter. So this is going to be the same in both sides here. So again, we'll have that cancellation. We'll end up with mass per time. When we divide mass by mass per time, we end up with time. Okay, so we see the units working out here to give us a time value based on how much time this mass is in the system. Okay, so we have the mass on top, and on the bottom what we have here is that flow rate um, times, uh, times the concentration. Normally we do V over Q, so now we do Vx over Qx. Okay, so it's basically the same thing, um, except instead of just the water, we're adding the, the mass factor. Now, earlier we said that the Xe is zero. So this guy goes to zero, and that means we can simplify, sorry, I'm gonna mark this so it's clear, just do that. So then it simplifies, this whole term goes to zero, which is why we can rewrite it as Vx over Qw xw, in the case of a perfectly functioning clarifier. Okay, so there's another term then that we can use, and I mentioned this earlier, but what we see here is our Qw. That's the, the flow rate at which we are discharging solids out of the system, out of the plant, is controlling this um, solids retention time, okay? So if we control QW, we can either change the solids retention time, or maybe if we keep that constant, then we can control the X. 
So that we get we end up with a lot of control just by changing QW. Um, so we might end up with situations where we have to solve for QW given some other parameters or some targets. Um, it just ends up controlling a lot of the system uh, and it, it can be quite handy for operators to deal with just that. Okay, any questions up to this point? So we've got this solids retention time and a food to mass ratio equation and those two are going to help us um, relate different components of the system um, based on uh, just how they operate essentially. All right so with that I've got an example problem here and I'm going to break it up into the different parts so we can actually uh, see it a little better but I'll go ahead and read it. The first three parts uh, well not part A but parts B, C, and D are essentially the same problem as we looked at last time and at the beginning of today. So if you wanted more practice on that, I'm going to skip it and let you solve that part on your own. Um, and then we'll look at the other parts which are uh, applying the formulas and stuff that we learned today. Okay, so we have a wastewater treatment plant that is being renovated to include a return activated sludge line. So apparently it did not have it before, and now we're adding it. Assume the influent MLVSS, that's, by the way, that's a term, mixed liquor volatile suspended solids. Sounds pretty gross, but that's just a term for how much um, VSS we have. Uh, you'll see that fairly often. They call it mixed liquor, just that mixture of wastewater. Uh, so the, the influent concentration then is zero. Um, so without any recycle line, it's zero. The following parameters are known about the reactor, which acts as a CSTR. So we've got a bunch of parameters um, for the system and a couple for the new system that's going to be designed. And so part A asks us to draw a schematic of an activated sludge system before and after the addition of a recycle line. Okay, so give this a moment to think about, maybe sketch it out on paper. So at minimum, we have an input and an output of this uh, activated sludge basin. So before adding a uh, recycle system, we would expect for um, this case to have the basin, and then we're going to need a clarifier to 
settle out the bacteria that we grew and we would discharge that waste. So if we're going to uh, draw it, we could draw it this way where we have a Q. Uh, I guess we would be, have a Q in, a Q effluent, and some Q waste. After adding it, this is just what we've been looking at um, today, the same schematic where we have that recycle line atom. So again, we have Q in, Q effluent, Q waste, and a Q recycle. Okay, so pretty simple. I just wanted to kind of have you think about and write down for yourself what this is, what this entails, and what that um, would look like as a diagram. Okay, so part B asks, uh, what is the final substrate concentration in the no recycle system? So that's looking for S. We essentially did this problem um, at the end of last class where we derived an equation for S given that we had a CSTR with no recycle and X E, uh, excuse me, X naught was zero. That's the same condition, right? So X naught is zero, um, no recycle. This is essentially the same as the pond example. Okay, so this will be good practice for you if you'd like to uh, try that on your own, the, a different system. Part C and D uh, are also just like that pond problem. Part C asks about the removal efficiency with the no recycle system and the MLVSS concentration. So that's the X in the no recycle system. So here again, we, we see that essentially we solve the mass balance um, for, the, for this case. So we do a mass balance on X for part A. We get S, we, move, we use that S to find the efficiency and we can move on from there to find X by doing a mass balance on S. Okay, so do those parts if you want some review of the example problem we covered last time. And now we'll take a look at uh, applying what we learned today. So part E asks if the sludge produ produced has a concentration of 12,500 milligrams per liter per liter VSS, which of the follow, which is now recycled uh, via the new recycle line at a flow rate of 150 cubic meters per day, what is the resulting quote influent MLVSS concentration in milligrams per liter VSS entering the aeration tank? And I, I make a hint to say refer to your drawing and do not overthink this problem. Um, I have given this on an exam before, and I had a lot of students overthink it and try too much stuff to do more than what was asked. So um, I'll give you a moment to think about this, and um, I'll let you know right now that uh, you can solve this problem, and it's not, it's not overly complicated. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to go ahead and try that. Um, just to double check um, that you understand kind of about this system and how to handle it.
Okay, so hopefully you've drawn something to the effect of our initial problem with the recycle. And I, I think it's really helpful to go ahead and label all the pieces. So if we, sh if we draw it up this way and we said our initial x naught is zero, then we're adding the recycle line to the system. We have this juncture here where we're adding it to the inflowing water. We have this x naught prime that we're trying to figure out what that is, right? So that's, uh, that's the question there that we're asking. So hopefully by that you can start to see that this problem is actually basically the same type of problem we've been solving since um, day one or two, where we just had a, a mixture of two streams and looking at the mass balance when we mix two, two different uh, concentration flows. Um, if you were thinking too hard about the problem, you were maybe trying to incorporate something that's happening in here and trying to solve for something with the new equations. But when we take a look at it, um, drawing it out this way, we're just really asking what's happening at this pipe juncture. And there's nothing fancy going on aside from two, two lines mixing. Um, and we're given, we're given all these parameters here. So I think the worst we have to do is convert this uh, 0.01 cubic meters per second to per day or convert the 150 cubic meters to per second. Um, either way, it's not a, not a huge deal. And then we can set up and say that our uh, Q times the original X naught plus um, plus the QR XR is going to be equal to the combined flow Q plus QR. I don't know why I'm drawing all sideways here. I guess I'll fix that for you. So we had QR, XR here. Um, so this is the combination of the amount in the recycle line plus the amount in the inflowing line. Um, this is going to be equal to our amount that we're looking for in the combined flow. So QR plus Q times that X naught prime that we're looking for. So we have all these parameters. We just need to do a conversion. And then once we do that, we can say x naught prime is equal to 1,850 milligrams VSS per liter. Now, one thing you can double check yourself here with is when you're doing this recycle line, you're clearly diluting it because you're adding it to a flow that has a large flow or you know it has some flow and zero concentration so the only way that this 12,500 can change is by being diluted okay so you can double check that that is smaller than what we started with and that'll be some confirmation and um, otherwise it's, it's a very simple problem here but an important one because we have to understand the system um, we need to understand what's actually going into it once we add the recycle. Okay, so part F then asks in the new system with recycle line, uh, the resulting food to mass ratio, um, and by the way, I didn't mention this earlier, but the food to mass, we don't treat this as a separate fraction. We just always treat this as one parameter. This is, uh, we, we don't separate the food and mass, this is just one variable here. And we keep it combined um, in that form. So we're never going to say, OK, uh, with our equation, we're never going to multiply both sides by the m there, because we, we just keep it there. So if we're given the food to mass ratio, or if we're finding one, we just use that, that total s slash m as one parameter. Um, so keep that in mind. 
Um, parameter is probably the right term. OK, in the new system with a recycle line, the F to M ratio is 0 0.58 milligrams BOD per milligrams VSS per day. What is the new MLVSS concentration in milligrams per liter? So we're saying, what is X now in the system? So again, draw it up. Uh, you know we have a food to mass ratio now, so consider how to approach that problem with this given information.
Okay, so hopefully you've taken a look and we've got this food to mass ratio, we've got an equation for that, which is QS0 divided by VX. So we have a given food to mass ratio. We have Q, we have S0, and uh, what we're asked is what's the new X uh, given this food to mass ratio, um, and we know the volume. So essentially what we're seeing here is we can control the amount of X that we have if we set the food to mass ratio. Um, and so if we have all those other parameters in place, then we can know, um, and given the information of the food to mass ratio, inherent in that it, it shows us some information about the, the mass itself, the mass of microbes. So as a concentration then, we can say this is going to be equal to 0 0.01 cubic meters per second times that 220 milligrams per liter divide all this by 500 cubic meters multiplied by the 0 0.58 milligrams BOD per milligrams VSS per day and we see also that we still have um, per day so we have to multiply um, actually we multiply this whole thing to get from uh, seconds here in the top to days we can multiply by 86,400 uh, seconds per day so we do all that and then our X should come out to be 596 milligrams VSS per liter So next part, part G, we have a question asking what is the flow rate of the waste sludge line? And we're going to assume a value, um, well, we're going to go ahead and use the value we just solved for. So we're going to use um, 596 uh, because we just solved that. Um, if you wanted to, you could solve this yourself using some other parameter like that um, on your own. Okay, so it's asking us the solid, what is the flow rate for the waste sludge line? Um, so what we're looking at is, we've got that clarifier. And we have that separation where we have recycle and the QW here is what we're looking at. don't have much time so I'm just gonna go ahead and start you here with Q we have a um, we want to know QW and what we're probably gonna need here is the solids retention time so theta C is VX divided by QW XW so take a minute to consider that
sorry, I meant to write here, it's QW on the bottom. That would help. So really we're given just about all of these parameters here. We know the volume. We've solved for the x previously. We're given a solids retention time for eight days. And we also are given the, uh, the amount we are recycling. This was given earlier, um, so the XW was 12,500 milligrams VSS per liter. Okay, so if we put these together, we're going to need to, well, actually, no, we don't. Um, we see these the liters here cancel for our for us the milligrams VSS per liters, um, and then we're just left with meters per day, and that's fine to leave our QW then in cubic meters per day, and it turns out 2.98 cubic meters per day with this calculation. So we see this is a very small amount of volume per day, um, and in large wastewater treatment plants. Um, these flow rates can get a little bit big um, to the point where you might be taking truckloads of solids to the landfill kind of on a routine basis, maybe every hour um, or a couple times a day. Um, usually what happens with this waste is you dewater it further, uh, put the sludge through some like a belt press or something to extract more of the water out, uh, save on some of the shipping costs and the landfill costs, um, but ultimately it's not a not a very large volume or uh, flow rate compared to uh, the, in, the discharge of the entire system. So the last problem here asks what is the hydraulic retention time for the activated sludge before and after the recycle line, and that's just a slight bit of a trick question because it doesn't change, right? Theta is V over Q in both cases. And that turns out to be 0 0.58 days. All right. So any questions? Yeah. What was the volume of 1,200 um, meters used at the 500 station? Um, so good question. Why was the volume 500 instead of 550? That was just because I must have changed this at some point and didn't notice. So I was going off some old notes. and. We're just going to pretend that was 500 the whole time. So we'll just say that's 500. Um, might double check my calculations because actually my, do my notes have it written as 550. So I think perhaps I have the calculations in it as 550, which it looks like I do. But I wrote it wrong all day today when I should have been writing 550. I'm, I'm going to bet that's, that's what just happened. So. Thanks for that, and I apologize for the confusion. I'm going to come back and fix it for you. Uh, any other questions while I do this? What's that? I only wrote it twice? Um, yeah, it, it should have been 550 anywhere I did write it, so I'm just trying to find the, the spots. Yeah, so that should be it then. All right, well, that's all I've got. So we'll see you, um, see you on Tuesday. Have a good weekend.